Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for staying with us into the second segment here together with Matt Presti and Robert O'Tay. We are talking about Walter Russell, uh, Leo Russell, and of course the Brazilian philosophy and uh, ideas about the universe, where everything comes from, and we're trying to uh, get to some of the answers of what we all want to know. And I was thinking in the break here, guys, uh, if the if I wanted to your comment on this, if there's anything good coming out of the you know the, the the quantum mechanics kind of field and and you know the, the what the bleep do we know kind of movies and everything else i mean these are some of the ideas that uh amit goswami has brought to us and at least it makes people look in a different direction they uh, have a little bit more of of like that their own consciousness is part of the picture a little bit more and and understandably although we're not my might, might not be there yet uh at least might maybe it's a it's a you know we're heading in the right direction it's kind of what you said earlier matt that if we keep looking, keep looking, and don't give up on, on you know, um, believing that we have all the answers, we might eventually get there. What do you think? Well, that's certainly, you know, a step toward consciousness is always a better step. <laughs> uh, regardless, um, Russell and other illuminates like Tesla, who wrote of Russell's work, that he should, uh, you know, he was one of the few people that actually wrote back and actually read the Universal One. He told Russell he should lock that in a sepulcher for a thousand years because <laughs> mankind is not ready for it. And when the greatest electrical engineer in the history of mankind uh, says something like that, uh, that's one of the things that caught my eye when I when I debated whether or not I should read The Secret of Light. I, I noticed that quote from Tesla and uh, verified it later in Atomic Suicide and uh it's just amazing thing. I mean, uh, basically, what we're talking about is 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 mankind, as Russell said, when he understands the universe in these simplistic terms, this this easy to understand process, he will advance a thousand years in that day. I, I, my question is, why should we wait? Yeah. And I I know that there's a lot of innocent and um, you know, very um, insightful and inquisitive people in all the fields of research but it doesn't give us a right to ignore um, even with that innocence and inquisitiveness to ignore something so profound as a message which could help us to progress a thousand years in one day so um, I'm going to take Tesla's advice and and um, I'm thanking Leo for helping him to uh, get this stuff out there Walter that is so I'd like to um, see more people at least take a look it's there's no harm in looking you know I've, I've i've looked at quantum physics i watched what the bleep do we know i watched down the rabbit hole um i watched all that stuff multiple times but how about all those people who have seen that already give give walter russell a chance let's let's see if we can take science a thousand years into the future and i think one of the most beautiful aspects of this science is that it truly mar- marries spirituality Something that uh, science and religion, to me, I feel like uh, you know, science and religion are two divorced parents pulling on each one of my arms about to tear me in half, and I just want to be loved. So <laughs> in a sense, you know, it, it is the most beautiful marriage of, of science and religion, philosophy. Uh, I wouldn't say religion, I'd say philosophy and science more or less. And you could call it psilosophy if you wish. But Love new words, um, great one. Yeah, we actually have philosophy.org <laughs> and .com just in case we want to you know, offer that up someday. <laughs> but um, interestingly enough, you know, I think that uh, knowledge gained through illumination, and, and Tesla is another example. He said he had a flash walking through the park and he saw the AC motor completed in his mind. And his task was just to build it. Like Michelangelo could look at the stone and he said his task was not to chip away the stone but to, to carve out that which already lay within it. So it's it's this mystical, that's what we call mysticism. And, and it's so mystical because the average man doesn't know how to use anything but his senses. And the great people that come to us, we, we call them the messengers. They come to us and they give us the process of creation and co-creating um, you know, that we would do well to listen, and I think um, the way Walter proved it is he demonstrated his knowing in action. You know, he was a, a master sculptor, master painter, master horseman, master woodcarver, master geometrician, master scientist, master philosopher. I mean, I could go on and on. He had 11 conferred degrees and, and dropped out of school in the fourth grade. How do men that don't have an education do this? 
uh, well, he acquired his knowledge through the light of mind. And, and that's something that quantum physics doesn't take into account. Um, so they do take consciousness into account, but I, I think it's, it's not the kind of consciousness we're, we're seeing Walter talk about, where this consciousness is also your consciousness in the sense that you can command it to the degree that you understand how it works. And just my own personal understanding of the philosophy, when I begin to apply it to my life over the past three to five years, I've done more in my lifetime than I have in all the other years of my life combined simply by understanding that my mind is an extension of the one mind of the creator, the universal one. All that power is my power to have based on my uh, desire to wield it. Mm -hmm. And it can't be approached by the profane. You can't you can use this power ignorantly, and it, it, it's disastrous in your world, like nuclear power is. Uh, you know, we, we put the cart before the horse developing nuclear power before we realized its dangers. Uh, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So yeah. uh, a step in the right direction, consciousness, um, I think it could be boosted greatly. And uh, it's like uh, taking a shot of you know, espresso, in other words, to uh, just speed up the process. <laughs> Robert, anything add to add to that? Oh, geez. Uh, Henrik, I, <laughs> I'm so so opposed to the, what the bleep do we know and the secret. It's, it's not even funny. I mean, you know, this information is gathered through channeling. You know, Jay-Z Knight produced this this stuff based on Ramtha, you know, a 35,000-year-old Lemurian warrior and all this. You know, it's just... It's... It's stomach churning is all I can say. There's no such thing as a law of attraction. There's no such thing as attraction or repulsion in the universe. I mean, these are allusions to our senses. Like if we take two magnets, so we take a north pole and a south pole, and they go together, it's not because they're attracted. They're seeking voidance. And the reason being that the electrical rings that give them their so-called magnetic properties, which are really electrical, are spinning in the same direction. So they can mate. But if you take two south poles and try to mate them, they won't because they're spinning in opposite directions. And the same with two north poles. So the, the absurd idea that this all you have to do is think of your fantasy world and you will, by some law of attraction, attract wealth and prosperity and happiness to you, it's absolute insanity. Then you have people like CIA-owned ions, which Edgar Mitchell, you know, who claims to have walked on the surface of the moon flying in an eighth-inch uh, aluminum can to the, to the moon and walking there somehow magically. Uh, this guy is pushing, you know, the secret and what the bleep do we know uh, as the kind of cutting edge of consciousness when it's just based on channeling and new age uh, mind control. I mean, a lot of this stuff is authored by the CIA. You know, the CIA, to me, owns the New Age movement. You know, Course in Miracles and all these other many strange, uh, you know, things that are coming out from the New Age movement are actually authored by, like, people in the CIA and stuff. So I don't trust channeling. I don't trust any of this, um, any of this stuff that's coming out of uh, people that channel information for, for, for what, you know, do you do you think it's for? That, that's all I can say. Sure, no, no worries. Do, do you think it's for the purpose of, uh, you know, laying the foundation for basically a new a new belief system, a new uh, you know creation of a religion, basically? No, I don't. Well, you know, f from where Edgar Mitchell and people like that are coming from is like all about this aliens. The aliens are coming to save us. You know, Sheldon Nidal, Galactic Federa Federation of Light. Uh, you know, I mean. I don't want any freaking aliens to save me. I don't need an alien to save me. <laughs> you know, I have divine connection to the creator within the stillness of my own heart. Why would I need some alien to save me? You know? And I think that's I think there's an agenda behind all this. I think this alien thing is uh is being run from from up top, you know? It's a top down pyramidal uh mind control racket that's uh, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I don't have anything to do with channelers at all. I've met many of these people face to face and I'm just, they're bullshitters. Okay. That's all there is to it. I mean, that George Casavales guy or whatever his name is, he said, we're all going to ascend into the fifth dimension, uh, you know, on the 21st. Didn't happen. You know, I mean, you hear this kind of stuff all the time from these channelers. So I'm 100% opposed to channeling. I'm 100% uh, opposed to outside information. I think you should get it from the, you know, the core of your own heart, you know. Make your own divine connection. You don't, we don't need a priest between us and the Creator anymore. We don't need a, a sign.
scientist between us and uh, you know their atheism or you know their agnosticism anymore. We each have access to the divine, you know, and l let's each take responsibility for our own lives and and mine that information that we have as our own self knowledge. Indeed, I don't want to mull on this for too long, but do you think that there could be uh, I don't know what to call them lower end entities that are actually getting in there? Um, you know, posing as 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 a higher voice, uh, you know, kind of preventing, I guess, Absolutely. to reach the higher. Connection. I think that's what all channeling is. Is at, totally one hundred percent. I think that I've got a really good vid on my uh, my playlist on my YouTube channel where these people were involved in channeling for a couple decades, and at the end of it, they realized even the so-called good ones, the ascended masters or whoever they they thought they were communicating, they were all just wanking their chains, man. They were all just you know using these people and and deceiving them ultimately just playing games with him and I totally believe that there are you know those nefarious entities uh, that those people are tapping into that source and not you know why would you go there when you can go straight to the creator that's all I'm saying so how would you go about quality control here uh, I mean I'm not into channeling either but let's say that someone is doing it and, and uh, I mean how do they know that they've connected with the the real thing if you know what I mean that's what I'm saying. I'm saying flee like the, you know, run like the wind, man. Just get away from channeling. Don't have anything to do with it. You know, I'm not interested in it at all. I don't listen to channelers. Yeah, and I had an experience with a channeler out in Colorado, and we saw firsthand just how horrific it can be, you know. Yeah, well, let me let me ask you, I guess what I was going to get to is a little bit how it differs from what Walter is doing in terms of connecting with the source, if you will. Do you want to take oh, that, Matt? Sure. Walter's inspiration speaks for itself his work speaks for itself he put demonstrated in action his inspiration which serves to re-inspire others inspiration in my opinion is truly the greatest gift a human can give to another because that is the state of ecstasy that the creator creates the creation in and that brings me to another point we discussed earlier about discussing the process of how we actually build bodies in like fashion I mean, if if this if if the mystical interpretation of the universe is correct, and and God thinks his images of his ideas of mind into form, then man would do the same thing in the likeness of it. And there's nothing in this world that wasn't first an idea in a man's mind. And the idea of a nuclear missile is also an idea, but that doesn't really inspire people, does it? So. But but yet, a beautiful piece of music can move a man's soul to go out and re-give that inspiration. Um, the question you have to ask is, is what you're studying, is what you're listening to, is what you're, list what you're perhaps channeling, is it inspiring you to create a better world? Is it freeing? Is it liberating? Is it, is it cutting out the middlemen between you and the creation, the creator itself? Because in a sense, in Russellian science, he puts the ball of responsibility in the court of the person person who reads the work. He says, you are an extension of the creator, you yourself. And so your interpretation of your world, if it's not your own, it's somebody else's. And he just, he, he saw the world in, in a very simple way. He shared his philosophy. He lived it. It's what, that's why they call it a living philosophy. Uh, there are dead philosophies out there. The, the philosophy of war is, it, you know, the art of war is a philosophy, but uh, not too many inspired people live that philosophy because it <laughs> results in death. So if we're like our creator, we create a state of ecstasy around us, a, a state of creation. We serve to inspire those around us. We don't find ourselves on the victim list left out in the cold. We're actually taking part in co-creating our worlds with intent, with purpose. And even part of the Divine Iliad, just a small section of it, uh, derided those useless beggars by the road who ask alms, seeking not the kingdom of heaven within to share with men. But yet, I think he, he was uh, deferring to like those, those uh, people that just want to meditate in the mountains for, for their entire life. You know, a sense of purposeness, purposefulness is what the artist and the uh, creative man who is like the creator lives in a like fashion. So, uh, we have these inspirations. We have these ideas. That's why the idea is represented by a light bulb going off in the mind, which is your your pineal. You see the image of completion, and then your task set forth is to build that image into a body that you can then share and say to others, here is my body of work, here is my art, here is my creation, my writing. 
And, and if we live in and, – and the one thing that, that Russell said too is that uh, th- this universe is created from a desire to express love by the creator. And that's where the beauty of Leo's coming into the whole thing stems from. And if that's the case, then, then the giving of love for the re-giving of love is the whole purpose of creation. And if man follows that law, he creates a world of abundance and prosperity, a brotherhood and sisterhood of mankind. If he breaks that law, we get a world like we have today. And it's really so simple and it's right in our faces. It's so obvious. You know, the, um, these administrations of politicians, these, these secret cabals and secret societies, they violate the law constantly because they have to in order to survive. If they were to be benevolent, wonderful, giving people, uh, they wouldn't need to be secret, number one. And number two, we would see the effects and the fruits of their labors. But uh, yeah. I think they're a little bit afraid and they're terrified of what it means to actually, for people to actually figure out that they're in control. That, that the person they're trying, to contr- they're trying to control is actually the one in control because you have to agree to give your power away. And, you know, Black Elk was another one who, who said, in a sacred way I walk, in a sacred way I talk, meaning that, that when you approach your universe from that source of sacredness, you know, and he was another one who had that vision of a, uh, in his writings for Joe Nehart, John Nehart, the Black Elk Speaks, he said, he looked out across the mountains, he saw the central mountain, he realized the central mountain was everywhere, and that he was the central mountain. So the center of stillness within the self is the omnipresent point of the creator God that is not anthropomorphic, and it's, it's sexless. It's omnipresent. And that's a difficult thing to do for people is to imagine what omnipresence means. So yeah, yeah. I think when you, when you fully realize that you are an extension of God, in other words, when you walk and talk with God, you're talking with yourself, as, as Russell said, and you are God in that sense. But uh, those who realize that could not possibly harm another person because they realize that, that the other person is them. They'd be harming themselves. And if we all had that realization tomorrow, the wars would cease instantaneously. But that would defeat the purpose of the drama of the entire play of creation on this planet that we find ourselves. So uh, I would just liken it to a saying that Walter had, uh, which was, all men will come to me in due time but theirs is the agony of, of awaiting. And that was from his Divine Iliad. Those were some of the words of inspiration that he wrote down. Hmm. So, Very interesting. Matt, yeah. I wanted to ask you also regarding if, it's a, you know, if, it, if it is a play of creation, if you believe, or, or if you want to take this, Robert, that we're, because you said earlier, Robert, uh, you know, alluding to the, the pre-high civilization, and there seems to be a cyclical, uh, catastrophical nature to our existence how it's unfolding and all that, if our ability to understand these things and, and realization and, and, you know, showing, um, you know, affection and kindness to, to you know, our fellow man, etc., is driven more by a cosmic cycle that is, is something that is external uh, to us, uh, Matt or, or Robert? Well, sure. Um, cosmic cycles do have effects on us. I mean, Obviously, astrology is a, is a holy science, very astrotheology, very old. Uh, a lot of these wars we see start, they know to start these things on certain days of the year at certain times. But uh, as far as, as our own personal consciousness, I think we do, you know, feel more sexual in the springtime. There's a reason for that. Uh, there's reasons for uh, other things, but consciousness alone by itself is, is, uh, I guess you would say it's it's almost as if, uh, you know, the ball rests with us. In terms of what do we want to make our world, we're, we're, we're reaching an age in our humanity where we can't blame cycles any longer, I think. We have to take responsibility mm. uh, that, that cycles do have effects, but that we don't have to have the same old reactions to them. We're, we're becoming knowledgeable enough in our awareness of ourselves uh, Walter said, there, there's all these sciences, but there's no science of man. And that's what their, the whole founding mission of the University of Science and Philosophy was, was to, to give man a science of himself, a science of mind. And he was friends with Alexis Carroll, with uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, Mark Twain, and they met under the guise of the 
of a club called the Twilight Club. And uh, Edwin Markham, who said, in vain do we build the city if we do not first build the man. So as we've had this past hundred years of absolute greed ruling in man's world, uh, they've, they've used cycles of, of you know, motion to, to use as, as, a, as a, a springboard for their own dark agendas. But I think we're beginning to see it backfire on them. I think consciousness is old enough now that it's beginning to realize that it, it has more than just a, a, a passive part in this act, in this play, in this drama. And um, that's one of the things we're trying to spread is the power of knowing that you have the power within you, yourself, to make a difference in this world. And that's what Gandhi did. He said, be the change you seek. You know. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's going to be a interesting next uh, 10 or 12 years to see where we can actually take this as a human race. Yeah. I would like to see it move toward a brotherhood and sisterhood where we can uh, you know, reap the abundance of, of love shared you know, through the hearts of men and, and put this barbaric system of death, war, drones, and secrecy and illusion away once and for all. I mean, the other option is we can explode our planet. But uh, I would rather see it go in the way of, of giving love to your fellow man so that that love can be regiven. And we do that by being the change. We have to be that love that we seek to see in the world. Is the, is the force that, uh, uh, what should we call it, uh, you know, dipole, is it that uh, extreme, polarized, I guess is the right word for it, that the direction is either, you know, A or B, <laughs> you know, good or bad? Is, is that the uh, cusp that we're on right now, do you think, Matt? Well, it, it can definitely go both ways. I think it, it comes down to a personal choice, you know, and, and I don't condemn anybody for, for choosing out of ignorance something that's comfortable, like keeping your job and not looking at any information that might open you up to a different reality. I mean, uh, basically, the Russells said there, there is no death. We, we unfold from birth and refold to it, which is that still white magnetic light. Mind comes from its seed. It lives for a time and then it dies. And uh, we have all eternity to figure out. If not in this lifetime, we'll do it in another lifetime. If we blow this planet up, there'll be billions of other planets in the solar in, in the uh, universe that we can reincarnate on. But at some point, you know, man can either choose to to move toward the the light of his mountaintop, which is the realization of mind is causal, and your part in it, and your your um, ability to create and co-create, or we can move backwards toward the blackness of our jungle from which we extended from. And uh, basically that's, you know, it comes down to a personal choice. I think it, from what I'm beginning to see personally is more people taking an active part in their own lives, putting down the savior mentality that someone else is going to figure it out for you, someone else is going to save you from these things, and actually taking a part in building a life worth worthy of saying you're human. I think it's just a, an aspiration that, that people are getting tired of business as usual. They want something different. We're seeing these communities develop around the world. We're seeing a huge push like never before for alternative energies and different modes of thinking. And I think that's good. And it can only lead to things that are good. As long as its seed is good, then the fruit shall be good. Yeah, for free energy is the thing I want to get into a little bit later as well. But we, we wanted to get into some more things that, uh, well, you know, confirms Walter Russell's work. Uh, Robert, tell us more about Frank Chester and what he's been doing and how he's uh, confirming the work. Yeah, he's really doing some incredible work by going through laborious, long, it's taken him like 12, 13 years now, through this empirical research to show these unseen space geometries, which are called magnetic space geometries in Russellian science. He's proving them. I mean, he's been able to go through little by little he started out with like, um, you know, a chunk of clay and some toothpicks was his first. He was a sculptor. So this guy, he taught um, sculpture in colleges and stuff and, and painting and, you know, for his whole life. And then when he retired, he got into to developing this idea based on Rudolf Steiner's ideas of a seven-sided form, which inevitably led him to the chestahedron, which is um, it's like a platonic solid in the fact that it has – equal surface areas, but there are two types of surface areas rather than one, which is typical of platonic solids. In, in a chestahedron, there are triangles and kites, but they all have the same exact surface area. 
And he was able to show empirically that the heart is a twin opposing vortices. It's based on the very same thing that an atom, a galaxy, or a sun is. And that is the male and female sex divided vortices as they come together and mate with each other. And the heart is not a pump. It's an implosion regulator. And that's, uh, that's pretty easy to prove because even in an embryo there is no heart, yet the blood is moving through it. The whole point of uh, the blood is to move through implosion, through the, the rifled arteries and veins of the human body. And so implosion is the natural flow. Everything is based on spiraling phi. Everything is uh, part of this electric universe of, spir of twin opposing vortices, the spiraling phi that, phi that basically creates all aspects of, of reality, whether it's the spiraling of the wind or electricity, or of light, or of water, or of blood, or of sap. All these things are spiraling, and that's the natural motion to creation. So Frank has been able to demonstrate empirically with his research uh, the very foundations of Rasselian science. What he's doing is he's seeking to show you these, these geometries, what, what Russell calls magnetic space geometries, uh, that that are basically give form to everything in this creation of the electric universe. The human heart, for instance, is surrounded by this chestahedron. It's a form that he was uh, able to put in an implosion tank with water and reproduce the aortas of the, of the human heart. So he can show you that the heart is definitely not a pump. What it does is it breaks and controls the implosion of blood and then redistributes it through the other vortex, you know, through the body. So. Uh, you know, there's so many things about our science that are backwards, and now we have somebody that's coming in and proving empirically that which Russell found, you know, through divine illumination. So what we have with Frank Chester and Walter Russell is a perfect marriage of both divine illumination and the the scientific process of empiricism. So he's a uh, He's, he's gained a huge following lately. Uh, he's being funded. He just got a laboratory and, and a research facility uh, given to him in San Carlos, which I'll be going down to uh, this Saturday and filming. He'll be speaking there. And it's the grand opening of his new facility. And he's been given seed money by the medical establishment to study the heart because he's got some insights into the human heart, which you know, basically is as above, so below, as within, so without. The heart of an atom, the heart of a galaxy, the heart of the sun, the heart of the earth, they're all functioning according to the same exact principle. We have a seamless com uh, cosmology from the atom to the galaxy. There, it's not divided up into little compartments of uh, uh, compartmentalization of consciousness or so-called fields of study as it is done in academicism. What we have is something that's a seamless cosmology that explains how everything in the entire universe operates. Yeah, it seems that, uh, again, we're back to the division idea. I mean, I've, I've talked about this before, but just the, we, we're taught that people who in, in, in the past were into, you know, alchemy and things like that, that they were, uh, you know, that they are occultists or that they were into some kind of evil work. But I mean, these these are holistic uh, people and it's it's what you Matt said with Walter as well that he was into many different things. He's, he's an artist primarily, and then you know you you know many different things. It's like a, a, a Renaissance man in that sense, really. And 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 that's yeah, he's what a polymath. We've, yeah, exactly. And and that's what we've walked away from. We we we're dividing dividing compartmentalizing, looking at smaller and smaller parts, and and now we're into uh, you know uh, electromagnetics and just you know applying the pill or you know the, the chemical or something like that to try to uh, you know change it or affect it that's that's occult to me what we're doing today that's pharmacologically that's that's the occult you know <laughs> yeah well susan Iserbite has proved that empirically as well with 150 years of chronological dumbing down through the academic system you know her uh, the deliberate dumbing down of america is it's it's irrefutable you know it shows you how like, you know, kids uh, coming out of the eighth grade in uh, central Kansas in the late 18, eight, 1890s and stuff, they knew more. They could pass a test that probably none of us could pass today you know, because education was so different. Yeah, it's going backwards. Uh, let's talk about how Absolutely. things are created out of the the stillness. I mean, if there is this so above, so so below kind of concept, and 
it doesn't really matter what we talk about, but I mean, if we look from things like stars to planets and down to creatures and, and the human body, how are those things pulled together and manifested out of out of stillness? Matt or, or Robert? You want to take that, Matt? Sure, I'll give it a shot. Well, um, like so, it, like sorry any, about that difficult question. That's okay. <laughs> no worries. No problem. Uh, we, we we often both talk at the same time sometimes. So um, we uh, from Russell's writings, you know, planets, stars, galaxies are all born from primaries, uh, just as animals, plants are born from the seed of the mating process of of the, the male and female uh, divided sexes. And what the divided sexes do is come together as one for a brief moment or longer. And in that oneness, that the division is repeated. So there's the process again. Um, the sun is the birther of the planets. Uh, this is a fundamental difference between the way the Big Bang purports that gas is cooled and happened to form Jupiter and Saturn just, you know, all happened to be effects of this gaseous cooling and you know but in Russellian science all planets are born from their primary and it's interesting to think of it that way and 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 some bit of evidence that can support that is is as a small child if a, if a child is small when it's born and up until the time it turns 18 moves out of the house at least in America if, if you're lucky you, you move out by 30 these days but um, a small <laughs> child grows from a small seed it's a small being and you nurture it and care for it, and, and, and you know it, it goes on its own way, and eventually becomes old, and and so so be it with the planets. You know, Mercury is very small because it's young; it's still a baby, uh, so it doesn't have any children of its own. Uh, Venus being the same, Earth has one child, and she's already begun to ablate, which means she's aging past her her uh, condition of of prime uh, charge into a state of discharge and what moons are actually rings that have been ejected from planet cores at the equators so these these motions in the universe are supportable by russell's theory uh russell's work and um you know from the star to the galaxy what robert if you want to touch on quasars and and possibly you know birthing of galaxies and things that would further well everything just- Everything conforms to the same exact method, you know, in, in nature. I mean, everything's born. It grows to maturity and adulthood. It kind of gets old and decrepit and passes on and is repeated. Everything is a cyclical repetition, you know, throughout nature. And uh, the cosmos is no different. I mean, in astronomy, you know, it's, it's, and astronomy is full of so many er- errors. It's ridiculous. I mean, they think that like a big, big star has a bigger tank of gas, you know, because it, they think it's burning hydrogen and helium and it's a nuke fusion star. That's all garbage. It has nothing to do with reality. A, a big star is a mature star. It's an adult star. Everything goes through these, uh, the same exact thing. Mercury goes to, when Mercury becomes, goes to the position of Jupiter, it will be almost the size of Jupiter. Because as each planet is birthed, another one is pushed out. This is all due to the electrical pressure gradients within the solar system. And all the other planets will be pushed out, and all the other planets expand. I mean, it's been proved in quite a bit of detail that planetary expansion is what's going on. You know, the, the, the tectonics and stuff, that's all, that's all kind of a myth, you know. What's happening is the, the Earth is ripping open, just like, you know, Mars and Jupiter and all the rest of the, the planets have been expanding as they move further and further away from the Sun into different electrical pressure zones. So this... You know, all of nature works according to the same exact principle, whether it's plants or animals or planets or suns or galaxies. All the stars are birthed by the galactic core, you know, and uh, the, the, the stars birth planets and the planets birth moons. I mean, it's, a, it's in a seamless cosmology. Everything obeys the same fundamental processes. Will, yeah, Henrik, if, if I might, real quickly, uh, Walter asked a question in a, in a new concept of the universe, and this this really hit me to to get it a little more. He said, if if atoms make up the sun, then why would the sun have different properties than an atom? Yeah, if it's made of its constituent part, the atom, then why would it act differently than the atom does? And that's just something to consider. So, 
Right. They have these boxes, all these boxes. You know, you have the strong and weak, you know, nuclear forces for the nuclear theory of the atom. You have other forces for galactic stuff. And it's all, it's, it's just a mess. I mean, the mythematics, you know, the gravitational pull and all this stuff, creating dark energy, dark matter, all these things are myths based on massive misconceptions of how nature actually functions. Nature doesn't function according to the way academia is reporting it. It's uh, like a lie that's getting more and more complicated uh, by the day. I, I've always found the expanding Earth theory interesting, and some people have explained uh, that due to this, we have the effect of, of gravity. But I wanted to ask you guys what, what gravity is, if it even exists in this cosmology. Well, Robert? Gravity is stillness. Gravity is stillness. Um, gravity is points and shafts of stillness, which the electric rings that give form to spherical and ring systems, like a ring system would be a, uh, a galaxy, for instance, but a spherical system would be a planet or a sun. Uh, gravity centers all of that. It's the points of still magnetic light. What, what you have to realize is there's the magnetic universe of stillness, which is omnipresent. It's everywhere, okay? So if there's a sun or, or a earth or whatever, or even a galaxy, it's centered by a point of stillness, which has a gravity shaft, which divides the male from the female. It creates the polarity of a north and a south, right? Everything in, in, in the universe conforms to this, to this basic process. So gravity is stillness, and so is magnetism. Magnetism is cathode planes of stillness, which house the cube. They're the, the still zero curvature planes, which give form to the spherical and ring systems, which are tiny, tiny systems within the core of that cube. The cube is literally millions of times larger than, if you look at the sun, the, the cube of the sun would probably extend out to something like what academia calls two to three light years away, although there's no such thing as the travel of light. But in that distance, it's just for reference, it's to, to tell you how huge the, the, the cube that gives form to the sun and the solar system is in comparison to the tiny solar system that centers it. So that's the, way, that's the way that nature works. It's all controlled by the omnipresent still magnetic light, which can take two forms. It can take the forms of cathode planes of stillness and points and shafts of gravity, which center. So it's both centered by still magnetic light, which is the creator, and it's bounded by still magnetic light. And those cubes exist in infinite regress and infinite extension. So they're everywhere. They're throughout all the universe. They're omnipresent. So, Robert, what about free energy? Are there any theoretical ideas about how a, you know, a so-called free energy device could, could operate within this concept? Absolutely. We were just blessed by a friend of ours in Finland. His name is Asa Ruo. He shared with us what's known as the Sajeka files. And uh, you can find these online, I guess. It, you know, it's quite expensive to buy the, the series. It's about 600 bucks or something. But uh, we got 92 pages of documents between Walter Russell and his wife and NORAD and Raytheon back in 1961. And they showed that, that Walter Russell was working with nature. He was trying to copy nature, which is biomimicry. He was showing how mankind, we wind our coils in cylinders and so there's, they're homogenous. Nature winds her coils in cones, in vortices. So what Walter Russell was doing, he was, he was creating twin opposing cones where you would basically put in, just for, for reference, like say eight, eight degrees of heat into the first cone. That is multiplied to 64 degrees, then to 512, then to 4096 through the spiraling compression of the cone. As the electricity enters the cone, it, get, it moves faster and faster and faster and tighter and tighter uh, uh, rings, which creates resistance, which creates heat. Walter Russell in 1961 gave NORAD, I mean, they worked. We have all the correspondence showing that they basically produced a free energy machine, which would put with a little bit of electricity would be able to heat an enormous amount of water and drive a steam turbine, which would produce unlimited electricity. You know, which you could feed back into the loop and just put a small bit of electricity back into the loop. And meanwhile, you're sucking off massive amounts of electricity. So we have the evidence showing, 
uh, this has been kind of rumored for quite a while about this NORAD, uh, this agreement with NORAD and the coils that he gave him. And now we actually have the physical evidence, the actual documents that show the process that they went through in order to create a free energy machine, which is given to NORAD and which has been hidden from public, you know, intentionally because the, the, the NSA and the CIA, they're, they're, goal is not to protect the people of this country. What it is is to protect the interests of the elite. And they want to make sure that coal and gas and uranium and us being slaves to a system where we continue to pay the elite and the powers that be for energy when we don't have to pay them for anything. I mean, that's the whole point of my work. Is to, it's not to recreate this stuff. It's to the hundredth monkey thing is to get a million or a billion people out there to realize look this stuff is already it, it exists we don't have to build this stuff the military industrial complex owns this stuff what we need to do is demand the immediate release of this stuff to save this world that's the one thing that's going to change this world is free energy technology it will reverse the pyramidal systems of control it will put power back into the hands of the people we can have point point of use generators and turbines so you don't have to pay an electrical bill you don't have to keep pumping gas you can get have electric cars run on this principle and there's no need to to be uh fighting wars in other countries to murder people and steal their resources and their oil and what have you in order to keep this this present stifling condition of slavery in place does the document clarify if, if walter russell willingly uh, gave this to norad Absolutely. He gave it to them just, you know, uh, he, he was, uh, I think he was a little bit naive. I think he really thought if he gave it to them, you know, they were going to give it to humanity. And they didn't, of course, you know, just like they didn't with Tesla's work. I mean, yeah. they did not want people getting free electricity beamed to their houses. You know, that wasn't part of their plan. They were too heavily invested in railroads, into processing centers, you know, for the gasoline and coal. I mean, they, they had already ca calculated the astronomical profits they were going to have through this system of slavery, which is based on explosion-based technologies, which works directly against nature, which works upon implosion. We're doing everything exactly the opposite of nature. And the only way to make this happen is to copy nature with biomimicry. If we start copying her principles, we'll be able to manifest the abundance that nature does. Like when you put one seed in the ground and you get a thousand out, you know, when you plant something. That's the way nature works. Nature doesn't work by taking. Nature gives because nature is based upon love. And the true definition of love is giving, so giving may give again. It's this iteration feedback process that the creator is perpetually creating creation with by giving love so that love can give more love. And that's the way we have to live our lives. Mm, yeah. So, so it's, sure. So it ended up in the worst hands possible. I've seen so many kind of fall Absolutely. into this trap. You know, you, you get a lot of these yeah, well intended yeah. people. I mean, we've talked with some of them too. I mean, all the hippies really uh, that, you know, end up working for the military and, and give all their stuff away. <laughs> I can't understand why. Right. You're so you're so right about that. I mean, it's it's crazy, you know. So is it uh, yeah, so taking it from them and and giving it to everyone else. And, and okay, so let's just ask that question. I usually usually do uh and I always preface it by saying I don't mean that it's they're in the good that they're in good hands now. Uh, you know, as I said, it they're in, I think they're in the worst hands possible, but nonetheless, there are, you know, there are people that are not well out there as well. And, uh, I mean, is there any potential danger in, in, in just providing the world with free energy and, uh, you know, endless amounts of it, if you will, uh, could be a, a, a bad scenario arising, people building, I don't know, weapons or mass destruction, what have you. I have no idea. Would it work, do you think? That's I can't, I can't see it all, but maybe you want to take that, Matt. I can't see it remotely. Well, I, I don't think that could have been any worse than what we're in now, um, Right. You know, what we've developed now in terms of energy production is based on explosion, and nature doesn't use fire to lift her forests into the air. You know, she grows 300-foot-tall red, redwoods and generates coolness as her forests rise, and uh, that's what biomimicry means. It's, it's you know, the, the whole side of the shell game, I think, with science is that they're, they're teaching the Big Bang, the ex we, we call it explodemia. It's a locked one-way street. And it completely disregards the uphill flow of electricity, which is achieved 
through the windings of the vortices. And a perfect example of, of one half of a vortice winding is a tornado. A tornado winds up the nebulous air above the top of its funnel, and it winds it down to an apex, and at that apex is where, at 90 degrees, all the energy that is wound up is released. And we see that energy blow houses away, decimate um, you know, trailer parks for some reason all the time, but um, it's just, it's one of those things that stares us in the face. And, and we just, if we could, you know, that's what Victor Schauberger tried to do was he, he worked for the Germans and our, our Air Force pilots called those flying discs he built Foo Fighters. Uh, so he, he understood through the motions of nature and how the trout was able to hold itself still in the stream through the implosion uh, method of its gills. And, um, uh, that's what we're missing. We, science conspicuously is missing the twin to the buildup of matter itself, which is centropy, the uphill flow of electricity. And uh, th they explain greatly how the universe tears itself apart, but if that's all we have is an incomplete conception of nature tearing itself apart, then everything we build will tear itself apart, which it seems to. Yeah. And the, the dumbest thing I think we've done as a race is dig up uranium, purify it, and light it on fire, <laughs> and then wonder how the hell are we going to put it out when it melts down beyond our control. Yeah, yeah. And we, we currently have... You know, two reactors burning in the world that we know of, that we're told of. That's Chernobyl, which they built a, a massive dome, uh, stadium sized sarcophagus of concrete over, and no one's allowed to go near that for the next 57,000 years or so, or however long it takes to, you know, for that reaction to reverse its, its potential. But now we also have Fukushima that, that is burning. And, you know, we don't have any way to put these things out. And, and that's dangerous. And we should, you know, to talk of building 50 more nuke reactors in the next 10 years is even more absurd. I mean, and, and you know, how do you, how do you deal with a psychopath? How do we deal with a group of psychopaths who wants to reap astronomical profits, put price tags on everything on the face of the earth, including us? How do we deal with them? We don't. We have to teach men and teach women to see the universe perhaps through the eyes of an illuminate. We have to show them that there's this uphill flow, that there's these vortices that create. And, um, you know, the, the, the rodent and the torus, the, this, this is an effect of the, the, the vortices. You know, the jive movement, as we like to call it. It's, it takes your mind away from the cause and focuses you on the effect. The toroid will never create free energy. It'll never create the heat to, needed to create free energy because it's missing the, the uphill flow. It's missing the spiral motions. And I think whether these guys are aware of it or not, they're not helping the situation to free the, the, the minds of children. If we just taught one class of 100 kids the uphill flow of electricity, the, the Rossellian process mixed with Schauberger, mixed with some of the things Tesla knew, in a, in in so many months or years, we would have these kids theorizing the kind of thoughts that would build the implosion technologies. Instead, we lock them into a, a one-way street of entropy that will never build anything but explosion-based technologies. And that's what we're really, we're, we're doing this. We never got together to do this because we desired money. We never got together to do this because we desired fame or a pat on the back from anyone in the New Age movement, who most of those people we don't even want anything to do with. We did this to try to help humanity out of a sense of love from the heart. I have two children. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's something I want to see a world for them to have the benefit of living in a world that's not, you know, that doesn't have a price tag on everything, that, that's not so controlled and Orwellian. You know, I have imagined the big black boot stepping on the side of humanity's face for eternity. And I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that, you know, kind of picture in my mind. So finding Robert and just, and, and finding the, the resonance that I got from Walter Russell and the beauty of the seamless. When I look out at nature, I see this, the rings of trees, the rings of my own bones, you know, and the spheres of my cells. These are rings and sphere systems. That's what we see populating the, the infinity of space. And so, you know, I don't see strings. I don't see particles or quantum. And, and, and if that's even necessary to see those things, it's simply enough for me to know that the universe moves in, in such a sacred way, it's a, it's a spiral, it's a loop, it's, it's beautiful, and it should, it's sacred. 
And I mean, we, we, may, we take it, we tear it apart, and we make a, a mess out of it. And that's because we don't understand the fundamental principles of creation, which somebody like Walter Russell was able to see because he penetrated the veil of the senses. He, he was, he was uh, how did he say it? Uh, he was, he was uh, severed from his senses, and he became holy mind. And if anybody's ever experienced a flash in their mind, and we've had actually probably 30, 30 to 40 people contact us over the past two years and say, because of your work of bringing Walter Russell and his illumination, it explains what happened to me. Even though my family called me nuts, there's a, a beautiful woman from uh, the UK who, who wrote that her, her father won't even talk to her because she tried to communicate this experience to him, and he, he thought she was crazy. You know, it's time we put down these terms and actually listen to people and their experiences. Something's trying to communicate to us, and it's not Artemis from the Pleiades. It's the creator, which is <laughs> you as an extension of it. I mean, this is something, you know, we all can tap into, and that's our saviorship. When we all realize that we have the power within us, we can manifest a different world. And that, that will inspire hundreds, if not thousands of other people to look for the answers within and the knowledge that comes from within the light of mind itself. So, Very good. Now, Victor Schauberger, as you said, was, you know, he was mimicking nature in his, in his work pretty much. He managed to show that, that nature is... Uh, the greatest teacher, and 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 at the same time, we're we're disconnected from from nature. I mean, our young ones are kind of entering into you know kind of an illusion about what nature is. It's the Disney version of of, of nature. To many people, nature is something that has to be combated, if you will. It, it, if we are left to our own devices as humans, we you know we we we, we freeze to death. We we can't survive a, a single day. You know, animals out there will eat us. We'll be consumed, if you will, by by nature it's almost like we we're, we're not fitting in and and so therefore at the same time we 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 become disconnected from it i mean who knows what really happened or why the, you know we ended up in this situation if we've just slowly kind of removed ourselves from it or nonetheless but if there is this other loving side to nature that is nurturing and giving the question is it's it's a switch that needs to take place in in the mind foremost for us to be able to see this for us to be able to uh you know experience that what what do you think about that matt well, that's correct. I mean, obviously, there's things that have happened along the line. Um, I would say that crawling into the cave of a sleeping bear is not a balanced act. And if you were to get <laughs> eaten by the bear, it would be your own fault for not, you know, um, having the sense to stay out of a, a bear's den. And, and it could have been an honest mistake as well. You know, sometimes, you know, when a bus goes off a cliff with a and it's full of full of children. Uh, there, there are many who say, well, that was God's will. Well, no, it wasn't. Perhaps it was the imbalance of the mechanic who failed to fix the, the front right wheel, which blew out and, and caused it to fall over. The, you know, we think that God is, uh, in, in some sense, vengeful because of the acts of nature. But uh, perhaps planetary change and uh, volcanic action, you know, building your town at the base of a, a volcano, uh, that's dormant and it blows up. Is that an angry God? Is that a wrathful nature? It's it's it certainly would look so to the people of that town or, or the surrounding towns. You know, just uh, recently seeing the uh, what happened in Haiti and and other places. This is actually Earth expansion. I think that is causing a lot of the the uh, effects that we see. But mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. what man does, I think, is he puts the the blame on 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 God when he should actually. Um, more or less see it as a, as a natural process. If man could understand, number one, that he doesn't die, that this is just an incarnation, uh, it would make a much better world for this, in the sense that natural accidents that, are, that occur in nature uh, would remove the sense of uh, blaming any sort of entity for doing this to man or something like that. But yeah. uh, it's basically, I think we need to age a little. A consciousness is growing up, and, and we're, we're, I think we're finally beginning to move out of the adolescent stage. But the adolescence in us, which is this elite, this sense of entitlement, I want to own the whole world kind of feeling and run the whole game, is beginning to wane in humanity. And I've had many friends say, well, there's there's a hundred. There's maybe a thousand people, and if we took them out, we we could get our world back. Well, no, it's not the thousand people that are the problem. It's the fifty million that are taking their orders that That's are the right. problem. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, like nature, I think 
what nature, the reason animals act on instinct is you could, what Russell said was, was uh, instinct is like God control, where God runs the show, the, the universal mind, and, and I, I, I should probably use the term creator so that it's not uh, taken out of context, but the creator is the instinctual control of nature. And instinct does exactly what instinct is supposed to do. You don't see beavers building dams in trees like bird nests. You know, and, and no beaver goes to dam building school. They know this innately in themselves, and that's that all, that omniscient uh, light of mind that that is accessible by all creatures and runs everything on instinct. Mm-hmm. What nature has done is is removed control from man. She's she's freed him from her grip, and I think that's that's purposeful. Yeah. And if I was a creator, I think I would choose one being to represent and express my nature on a planet. And and my nature being omnipresent, I would do this on all systems and all planets. I would have a being that represents, you know, excuse the noise, um, you know, the best that humanity can be. And and the artist is the one who who in a sense is the the uh, person that comes to inspire. And if I may just uh, quickly read one more uh, quote by Russell. He writes, uh, it is true that I have challenged the accuracy or completeness of the Newtonian laws of gravitation, and I will just as vigorously attack the other sacred laws. I'm sorry that an artist had to do it, but Sir Oliver Lodge said that no scientist could make the supreme discovery of the one thing for which science is looking and hoping. He said that such a discovery would have to be the supreme inspiration of some poet, painter, philosopher, or saint. And I think it's the man with the imagination who can clearly see the the purpose of his his reason for being and um that's in accord with nature the the purposefulness of it the flower is not an accident i think that uh, you know when man lives with a purpose the effects of his imbalance will wane such uh, his fear of nature will will conform to more of an abundant giving mm-hmm. you know to mimic nature instead of to fear it yeah you know there's always going to be accidents henrik i mean i don't sure, think even no. in a, even in a brotherhood and sisterhood or utopia there'll still be little kids that fall off of cliffs or well, well the, know, this is sorry to interrupt but exactly that's, that, okay. that, that's my point of all of this right. that we, we sure. we're, we're disconnected from how things are naturally run and i think what part of our this delusion that we're entering into is because we have a fear of death as you say and also this you know we want to create security around us where there is no security and there isn't no need for that either but we don't we don't realize this because we're living in a in a fantasy world where we think that we can't be hurt or anything can't happen to us but when it's the very accidents and challenges in nature that actually causes us to uh, you know, to grow and to and to learn more, and we're trying to you know completely you know rid ourselves from this, which is a, a an insane idea to do. Yeah, that's beautifully put, and I think if if more people realized that you know taking chances is part of living, it's as if the the authorities are have become so overprotective, and 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 you you know I could tell a story from when I was a, a young man, thirteen years old. Um, I used to love jumping off the high dive at our local swimming pool. Well, they decided to remove the high dive because they couldn't afford the insurance. (laughs) And then all these little kids behind me who I looked at, I just felt so sorry for them because they'd never be able to feel the thrill of what it was like to jump off. And this high dive was only 20 feet tall at the most. Mm -hmm. You know, the low dives were four feet. And, you know, I just, I looked at that high dive missing and I thought to myself, well, all these kids are going to miss the thrill of what it was like to jump off that high dive all because of an insurance company. Yeah. It's like we've removed the, the ability to live because of the fear of death. And, and so you see this cosmetic industry, you see, uh, you know, get this boob job, get your face lifted. You know, does, does Saturn go to the go to the doctor to get a get a facelift or remove her rings if she did we wouldn't even recognize it as being saturn <laughs> you know we, we have to love the fact that we get old we have to grow old gracefully i i tell my my beautiful woman you know not to even dye her hair anymore and she she hasn't in several years she, she i love her for who she is and who she's blossoming into that that's something leo helped me realize that uh 
that women are, are beautiful in old age. Why would we want to mask that and hide it just to appear young to society? Yeah. I mean, we, we have it all backwards. Our fear of death is what drives this fear of nature, I think. And when we embrace the reality that we cannot die, that we are immortal, that we live eternally, we act for a mo motion of time, a moment of time. It's called 80 years, a human life. And then we cease from motion. All things in the universe follow this process. All bodies live for a time and then, then rest from action. And then they repeat. And that's what the uh, idea is, you know, being in Russellian science, that ideas no never exist. It's simply simulated in motion. But the idea itself is eternal. And that's what the white light of mind is in Russellian science, which all mystics have described as, as being that white light where they get that flash of knowing, that eureka moment, if you will. Indeed. Now, death is the most central part of, I think, nature's process of how it continues to, you know, expand and and grow, and and that's what we have to, you know, come to terms with. I wanted to ask you the same, Robert. To, you know, what do you think about this whole problem of man's disconnection from nature and how, you know, those effects are are you know visible in the world, if you will. If you have any comments on that? Yeah, because we're basically working against nature. You know, we can't continue to, you know, explosion-based technologies. Or are diametrically opposed to nature. Nature doesn't work that way. Nature works through implosion. So uh, we have to copy nature. We have to be uh, mindful of the way that nature works, and we have to be basically create technologies that are based upon her motions, not these backwards, you know, motions that that basically enrich a small group of people, you know, at everyone else's expense. Now, before we wrap things up for this time, I, I, I want to you know get to some details again where people can find more about your work. And, and I just like to say that I'd love to do this with you both again soon. Actually, there's so much more to talk about, and it's you know it's it's we've just scraped the surface here, obviously, and there's just so much more to the story. I want to get both more from Russell's and Leo's perspective, and also also both of you individually. Uh, so you guys can keep that in mind. But why don't we, if there's nothing else, I guess we can. We can. I want to ask you if there's anything else you'd like to leave our listeners with. Uh, first, uh, Matt, how about you? And and uh, as you do that as well, give us your websites and everything as well at the same time. Certainly. Well, this is this is a stimulating discussion. I mean, these are the kinds of discussions that philosophers for centuries have had over cold ales in the you know in the comfort of their home in front of a fire or or um, in, in different situations. These questions are what drive humanity. It's what drove me to begin my show, The Exploration of Consciousness, which resulted in, in our series of work with, with myself and Robert. And um, I, I have really felt that there's been no better person on the planet that uh, when I started my show, I asked three basic questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Uh, who am I? Where am I from? And, and why am I here? Or where am I going? Basically, those, you know, those, those questions that sure. drive the philosophical mind. Upon reading Russell's work, I, I, I found many of the answers to be acceptable, you know, and, and Russell was just one of those people, uh, between him and Leo and the power that they exemplified in their joint work as one unit of creation, male and female equal in that sense. They were able to deliver the words of inspiration that lifts the souls of even the, the least among us. So to me, it was obvious that, that uh, finding the questions answered in that sense. Uh, my fear of death has been removed. Uh, my my uh, inability to produce the kind of life I want has been removed. My inability to find inspiration in the moment to cr be creative has been removed. Um, all these yeah. obstacles that I felt I was facing are now just uh, past memories. And the ride that I've enjoyed, and it's all been for free, it's, it's all been a, a labor of love from the heart, I feel as if my soul bank is, is overflowing. And so my material life may not be what my ego has always wanted, which was that big, nice house. I still have to carry, wa carry water and split wood. You know, that, that's something you have to do before enlightenment and after. So those don't change, but I just would fully recommend to anybody out there who's who's at that point where they just they want a better understanding of the world they live in, give the explanation of a divine illuminant a chance. Give it a chance because everyone I know that has, we've gotten maybe 50 letters from people in two years that said 
before I, I found Walter and Leo's work, I was an atheist. I'm not any longer because I can truly understand what God is from a different perspective. That's not, um, it's not like a violation to us, you know. Yeah. So in a sense, that that's the greatest thing I think is is the the ability to multiply the power of your own self, which the Russells called the self multiplication principle. And when you do this, you, you can't help but give the abundance that overflows from the filling of of the light in you. And this light is not a tangible light; it's just the light of of mind knowing that you're part of the source. And then it's really a true definition of what oneness is. And you can't uh, you can't go wrong with it. And uh, if there's anybody out there that that knows a guy who did more than Walter Russell in one lifetime, send me an email because I will check him out absolutely or her. So, <laughs> and uh, my website's mattpresty.com, and our joint website thesecretoflight.com. Very good. Thank you for coming on the program, Matt. We we appreciate your time and your perspective. And I want to switch over to Robert here. Please give us your website uh, again. And if there's anything else you'd like to you know leave our audience with some uh, last thoughts here, Robert. Okay, great. Yeah, it's free energy and free thinking. That's www.feandft.com. And 77G Slinger, as in Guitar Slinger, is the YouTube site where there's 666 videos which support Russ Allian science from every different angle imaginable. So uh, the last thing I would just say is that our ability to mentally image and to hold within our consciousness an idea of a better world is the, our greatest tool. They've called this daydreaming when we were you know, being indoctrinated. We were being brainwashed in, in academia and classes, schools, uh, Bible class, whatever. They want you to pay attention to what they're saying and not what is coming out of your own self-knowledge. And I would say that the, the greatest thing people can do is get in touch with the mental images and their own self-knowledge that they hold within themselves and manifest that, you know, visualize a better world for all of us and work with others of like mind because we are the change. It's not going to come from listening to the news or the idiot box or, you know, uh, the media from corporate owned, uh, you know, media and academia. It's going to come from us, the ones that who um, basically tap into our very own source, which is the creator. I mean, the source of all is the creator and all power and love and glory is due to the creator. Thank you. Thank you for your time today, Robert, as well. Great having you with us. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Well, I hope we can do this again, as you said. So uh, we'll we'll wrap things up for uh, this time and much more to come, I hope. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Many blessings. Much love. So you live in hell. You have to wonder why it is that people always seem to suffer in the well beneath the water lie the answers to the questions that we ponder do we try so hard just to falter sacrifices that we make upon the altar if we learn to come together then this world can change and we will make things better find yourself Find the others There's a world inside That you will soon uncover Find yourself Find the others There's a world out there That wants to be discovered When you find yourself So you have no time Follow the leader There's a goddess in you I hope you get to meet her Don't give your soul To no vampires You need to learn to pull yourself Out of the mire It starts with you You want a teacher Then stop believing Follow your soul, the heart knows better When you learn yourself, you will become the master Find yourself, find the others There's a world inside that you will soon uncover Find yourself, 
That concludes our program. We have more coming up with Ian Crane next. After this, Kevin Barrett, Graham Hancock, Chris Thomas and Dean Clifford will be joining us to name a few. I'd uh, like to extend my thanks to you for listening and for being a member. My special thanks to Fredrik, Lana and Elizabeth for being part of Red Eyes. Have a good rest of your day or evening. Take good care and we will talk to you soon.